The recently concluded 15th summit of the leaders of the BRICS countries in South Africa was really anticipated across the world. In fact, one could say that it was probably one of the most anticipated meetings of the year. Media reports had been coming in from across the world months before the summit itself. There had been a lot of discussion, for instance, on whether Russian President Vladimir Putin would attend. In fact, that in almost became the whole discussion for a point of time. But all of this uh, discussion could not really conceal the fact that this was actually a very important meeting strategically in terms of the future of the world itself. And it does seem like the meeting of the leaders has delivered some important conclusions that came out of Johannesburg over the past few weeks. To talk about this more, to analyze this, we have with us Manla J. Khadibe to the University of Johannesburg. Thank you so much for speaking to us. Thank you for uh, having me. And I think you are correct in your intro that uh, indeed uh, Putin almost became a diversion for this important uh, summit. Absolutely. Right. We actually, a few months before, had a discussion on the potential of the BRICS summit where we looked at some of the questions you're going to be talking about today as well. But now the dust has settled a bit from uh, the conference, you know, the official resolutions are out. There's been some rounds of discussion. So how, keeping in mind the anticipation before, and let's also be clear that a lot of anticipation was from the West which is almost predicting that everything, not, nothing really would come out of this summit, etc., etc., and that is clearly not what has happened. But keeping in mind all the anticipation, how do you sort of evaluate the results of the 15th uh, summit of leaders? Yes, you, you are correct that the anticipation uh, that surrounded the 15th uh, BRICS summit that took place in Johannesburg, in my view, uh, is a bit multifaceted, uh, encompassing both uh, its thematic emphasis and the declarations that were made at the end of the summit. Uh, I think you may recall that the decision to convene the summit um, over the, um, under the overarching theme that sort of emphasized uh, growth and sustainability, but most importantly, inclusive multilateralism uh, elicited a lot of consideration or consider considerable amount in my view of consternation uh, within the Western circles. Um, foremost amongst the not noteworthy uh, developments uh, that uh, garnered widespread attention that you speak about from across the wide array of medias across the world was the BRICS resolute intent uh, to broaden its sphere of influence and extend uh, its geographical uh, reach. Uh, and this uh, therefore is manifested through the formal invitation that was extended uh, to the additional cohort of uh, six nations, uh, namely Argentina, uh, Egypt, Ethiopia, uh, Iran, Saudi Arabia, where am I living, living out? United Arab Emirates, uh, who all of them will be assuming their, their membership of BRICS uh, on the 1st of January, 2024. But I think uh, prominent in my view, uh, or in the pronouncements that were made um, uh, uh, to these points of these six members sort of diverted the attention from the core tenets uh, of the summit's resolutions, which otherwise uh, encompass a, 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 an array of pivotal issues uh, addressed during the course of the summit. I mean, if you, th if, if, if you looked at the resolution themselves, they, there were five themes uh, that uh, encompass those resolutions. I think the first one is important one is partnership for uh, inclusive multilateralism. The second one speaks to peace and development. Uh, the third one, I think it spoke of, spoke to uh, mutually accelerated growth. I mean, which is the essence, um, if you ask me of what BRICS, why BRICS was formed. Of course, then there's issues around sustainable development. Mm -hmm and the deepening of people-to-people -people exchange and institutional developments. Right. Uh, so in this context, uh, coming back to the point of expansion itself, which, uh, which like you said, nonetheless seemed to gain all the media attention, and uh, that's really what a lot of people are looking forward to. A very interesting choice of countries, six countries, like you mentioned, from uh, various continents, from Latin America, Africa, and Asia, uh, a variety of political interests. So how do you sort of evaluate the six countries, you know, what do you think the BRICS leaders were saying with this choice of these countries? Well, in my view, I think the, the, the recent expansion of the BRICS coalition, uh, I think it necessi necessitates a contextual understanding 
uh, that intrinsically linked uh, to the first theme, in my view, uh, of the declaration, uh, the establishment of partnership for inclusive multilateralism. And I think that the overriding, uh, the overriding call um, that uh, permeated the build up of the summit and as well during the deliberation, um, uh, during the summit, uh, pertains to the role of traditional international institutions um, of global governance, uh, chiefly being the United Nations and the IMF. Uh, therefore, uh, I think that the call um, to reform these institutions um, has been getting louder uh, given the greater voice uh, and or the need to give the greater voice uh, to the nation of the developing world um, and those in the global south. And I think that for me, this was the uh, rallying point uh, for the 15th uh, BRIC summit. As you may recall, even the United uh, Secretary General Antonio Guterres spoke in favor of the reform uh, of the Bretton, world, uh, Bretton Woods institutions and the democratization of the United, uh, uh, of the United Nations Security Council, uh, which uh, interestingly he said, <laughs> I was really interested to hear this when he said, it still reflects the world power balance at the, uh, at the end of the second world war where many of the states at BRIC summit were still colonies and had no place on the table. Now, you, if you analyze the second theme of the declaration, which speaks to peace and development, one can see the rationale behind the BRICS um, um, and how it, why it has put in motion the process uh, of a workable plans to achieve these objectives uh, in the context of reforming the UN. And, and, and it's, it's Bretton Woods institutions, such as uh, including the WTO, to perform the functions of promoting peace and security, as well as sustainable development. For me, uh, this part of the this was part of the rationale that was behind the consider the consideration that guided the existing five members um, in their decision to invite the six members. In a nutshell, uh, the principal priority is to enhance global security. Of course, financing infrastructure developments uh, remains uh, important. I mean, if you look at, uh, I mean, for me, it would appear that the aspects such as uh, the size of the population, the GDP, um, and such neutral measures were considered uh, in, in taking these decisions. So of course, countries such as Algeria, so countries, countries such as Nigeria, Venezuela, uh, Mexico, Indonesia, um, where will, co will consider themselves uh, unlikely, unlikely not being included because they were really considered. But the long and short is that geopolitical consideration uh, undi undeniably uh, cast a substantial influence um, within the complex matrix uh, of this decision. Right, and I would think that uh, many of these countries, there, there might be future rounds of expansion also. So who knows who might be the next round of members. It's interesting you mentioned some of the countries in Africa because we have now both Egypt and Ethiopia, two new countries in BRICS. So how do you see BRICS as a block, you know, its role? Uh, is, there, is there a possibility of a greater role in the block for the continent? Especially we know there have been a huge number of uh, geopolitical developments of vast significance in the continent recently. So how do you see, you know, what do you see specifically the relevance of this expansion in the African context? Yes, I mean, if you look at, uh, I think South Africa deliberately, in my view, played uh, an, African card, an African card uh, in hosting uh, this summit as reflected in its theme, BRICS uh, and Africa. I think there was a part of, um, uh, of, of the theme. However, more strategically along uh, the, the theme of fostering peace and development, um, both Afri uh, countries, for the African countries that have joined, have been invited to join BRICS, uh, have roles to play in their respective region to foster, to drive peace and development. Of course, you could argue that Egypt uh, from more of the Middle East a perspective and Ethiopia from the Horn of Africa, which continues to be a volatile region if you think about uh, what is happening in the Horn of Africa. But we cannot discount Africa's interest in reforming 
uh, the arrangements for global economic governance and it's supporting the sustainable and inclusive development uh, in Africa and the global south. Therefore, for me, these three countries, um, the African countries who are now members of BRICS, are major economic powerhouses in their regions and have a huge role to play in the development uh, of the continent. All right. And also moving on to another theme, which was really very prominent in the discussions prior to the conference, that was of the global financial architecture itself. Now, uh, of course, we know that uh, we are long, a long time away, maybe from an alternative to the dollar in terms of a currency. But there was definitely, I think, a further impetus to trading within mutual currencies. So how do you see the question of financial architecture itself? You also mentioned some of the issues of the Bretton Woods institutions as well. Yes, I think the point on the financial architecture must be understood uh, in the context of the BRICS Bank itself, which has played a pertinent role in funding hundreds uh, of major infrastructure projects in the developing world. I think that the bank has, uh, will be able to finance many more when its foundation capital is increased uh, with the new incoming members. I think that, that another crucial aspect uh, of the bank um, uh, is that unlike uh, Bretton Woods institution, it does not, uh, or it does its work without imposing neoliberal economic framework, such as structural adjustments that the recipients um, of these countries um, uh, have been subjected to by the World Bank and the IMF. Uh, many countries in the Global South perceive uh, this uh, or the, the BRICS Bank as sort of an escape route from the enslavement by the Western capital. Uh, it is also an escape route from the dollar hegemony since the World Bank um, will be also since the BRICS Bank rather has argued that it will be opening loans, uh, for example, in Brazilian, South African and other national currencies. Uh, therefore, emerging co economies uh, that are heavily burdened um, with a dollar-dominated debt and facing fluctuating uh, exchange rates, uh, you know, things such as reduced uh, capital flow and tight, tight, tightened monetary policies from major global banks have uh, suffered uh, more than, you know, uh, economies across the key uh, economic uh, financial matrix. Therefore, in my view, many of these nations are now seeking <laughs> to reduce the dominance of the US dollar as the world reserve currency. So during the summit, um, the founding nations, uh, the five founding nations of BRICS, or we can say five, four plus one, it was South Africa joined later, uh, committed to using their local currencies uh, to raise fin funding for infrastructure development projects. In a move, uh, you know, in a move to decrease uh, the dollar debt uh, trap. Right, and I think also another important question that came out, and you know, I think there were echoes of it during the leaders' discussion. But I think it's a larger question, which is really of uh, the uh, question of uh, BRICS uh, internal dynamics. Let's call it that way, in the sense of how you would understand you know, the various differences or agreements between the various countries that form part of BRICS. Now, there's always been a school of thought, again, uh, once again, largely based in the West, which says that, and I think Jake Sullivan sort of emphasized it during the conference when he kind of said that the BRICS countries don't necessarily agree on everything. And hence, therefore, in some sense, they are doomed. Is that, is that is the kind of thought process that a lot of people seem to have, that somehow the BRICS countries need to agree on everything if they are to move ahead as a block. So how do you sort of see this summit in the context of the, this question, which is very pertinent, that BRICS countries have different agendas, they have different perspectives, they have, you know, on a variety of issues. So how do they nonetheless continue to work together as a block? I mean, in, in my view, uh, uh, what do NATO countries, for example, share in common beyond economic interests? And I think that this is the same logic uh, that should, or that drives an alternative perspective uh, from the oppressive regimes uh, of the current unipolar world. For example, uh, Saudi Arabia is likely, uh, Saudi Arabia joining BRICS and the BRICS a bank as a, uh, as a major contributor of capital is obvious. 
um, and it was, I mean, for me, it was an obvious uh, candidate for its, its, its inclusion along the UAE and Egypt, which are already members of the BRICS banks in any, in any. So the underlying, the underlying theme here for me is our economic interest. interest. Some talk about human rights issues uh, in, the, in the BRICS membership, but they, they speak about the human rights issues from a political sense. Uh, but nothing is said about uh, social economic rights. Um, so for me, that is just a politicking that seeks to maintain the narrow, uh, the narrow interest. Uh, um, every country um, uh, does not want to be oppressed and every country wants to be prosperous. And I think that the, um, the developing world, they see a, 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 a BRICS uh, as an alternative for building of a better world. Right. And finally, uh, you know, uh, in very good summit, I would think, for South Africa as well, uh, because it was definitely, I would say, a historic summit. But how do you see also the country's role as far as its membership of BRICS is concerned? Well, uh, the, I mean, for me, for South Africa, there are more benefits um, uh, than risks for, 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 for a country like South Africa uh, to be part of the BRICS and hence a number of African countries uh, will see the obvious benefits. I mean, South Africa's participation in BRICS, um, the country has always argued that it is uh, premised on its, on, on its national interest. Uh, for example, we, South Africa sees its engagement um, within BRICS as a way of enhancing its future growth, uh, which is obvious. Um, the development of pre, uh, the development of South Africa through its BRIC membership is also important because uh, South Africa has now, has now got an, an opportunity to strengthen the intra-BRICS relations uh, now beyond five beyond the five countries and to develop a mutually beneficial cooperation. So I mean, if you think about the points above that I've, I've raised about around the BRICS Bank and the the need to de-dollarize and so, uh, some of the obvious benefits that uh, developing countries from the global south, like South Africa, are likely uh, to benefit. But I think that South Africa is uh, punched above its weight uh, in uh, in being a member of a member of a BRICS and in hosting the a very successful fifteenth uh, BRICS uh, summit. Right. Thank you so much, Manda Khadibe, for speaking to us, for giving us an evaluation of how the BRICS summit went and I think uh, definitely this is not an event, this is a process which means that in the coming months and years as well we will see more I think aspects of this process playing out whether it be in the financial aspect, whether it be in geopolitics. So a lot to definitely look forward to as far as BRICS is concerned and I'm sure we'll come back to you for more analysis on some of these topics as well. Thank you so much for speaking to us. Thank you very much for having me. Looking forward to talk to you soon. And that's all we have time for today. Keep watching People's Dispatch.